Hello and uh, welcome back to another episode of Mission Possible Sofa Talk. This is our chance to sit back, relax and talk sustainable business with a couple of industry figureheads. Uh, we're broadcasting live again from the sidelines of ED Live, the exhibition up here in uh, Birmingham. It's the first day of the show, it's really busy. Uh, we've had standing room only on many of the theatres. Uh, and I'm joined now by a couple of the speakers uh, who have been appearing on those sessions. Uh, we've got to m closest to me here, we've got Julia Barrett, the Director of Sustainability and Rethinking at Wilmot Dixon, the family owned construction firm. And uh, here we've got Simon Graham, who's the Head of Innovation for De Corsi Alexander, saying that right? Uh, and that's a consultancy uh, which calls, it, calls itself the DNA of sustainable business. Um, so hello to you both. Have you met before today? No, it's no. our first time, but I'm sure it won't be the last. Okay, yeah, well that's what Edie lies about, we're about connecting people. So, Julia, um, you were in the morning session on the sustainability keynote, weren't you? Um, tell us a bit about what that session was, was like and, and what you discussed. Um, well, it was very exciting, very energetic, because we had the lovely Lucy Siegel there challenging us and telling us to be radical. Um, and we had Mike Pierce from uh, the Climate Group who was talking about the uh, exciting challenges that he set to industry around RE100 and the Electric Vehicle 100 and the third part of the pillar, EP100, uh, which was, is the uh, Renewable Generation. And um, the fabulous uh, David Simons from WSB who uh, was telling us about how he's inspired now not just only the UK business but his whole business to be future ready and to look at buildings beyond you know our lifetime uh, to serve future generations so very exciting. Interesting mix okay and Simon um, hello welcome how are you? It's very exciting to be here yeah. yeah good how was your session that you sat in on you were talking about the um, people, poli people policy and product that's right. Yeah well, our session was really interesting because we had um, lots of different perspectives not just on the, on the amongst the speakers, the panellists, but also amongst the audience. And we had a lot of time for Q&A, uh, which was really great because you get all the feedback from people and what the real problems they're addressing. So we were talking about what are the solutions to uh, barriers to innovation, and that was looking at things like how do you develop a sustainable innovative product, how do you engage the right people in it, how do you create the right partnerships, how do you make the thing into something which is do doable Yes, you want to have the, that space where people feel safe and they can have new ideas and they can fail, but how then do you translate that into something the business can actually use and customers can enjoy and why does society get the benefit from? Okay, well we'll talk about the partnerships bit in a moment actually, but before we go any further, Julia, I wanted to ask you about your job title. It's quite an interesting one, Director of Rethinking. So I don't think I've come across that before. Tell us a bit about what it is and what it represents for, for Wilmot Dixon. Well, Wilmot Dixon established its own central sustainability team back in 2006 um, and very wisely said, well, if we, you do what you always do, you'll get what you've always got. Actually, we nicked it from Einstein, uh, as you know, everybody in the industry knows. So, you know, this was about saying, well, we need to rethink what we do. And the name is stuck, which is fabulous. but. It does mean I, sometimes I have to explain my job title in, in plainer English. It's, it's, uh, it's good. I think it's, it says a lot about where Wilmot Dixon's sort of mindset is at the moment with regards to sustainability. Definitely. definitely yeah. So um, I'm going to talk about another kind of thing that's been mentioned on a number of different theatres as I've been walking through the, the show floors today, and that's the number zero. It seems to be coming up in a lot of presentations. Um, net zero seems to become the become the phrase of the moment. We've got. I guess contextually we were in a state of climate emergency. Um, according to the UK government, we've seen the school climate strikes, the Extinction Rebellion protests. Simon, I mean, in terms of sort of the feeling of momentum at the moment, even the, and the way that's transpired at an event like this, how can a sustainability environmental professionals harness that momentum and, and should they be setting net zero goals right away? There's two aspects to that. Firstly, there is there's a, a sense that we ought to be setting challenging targets. And zero is a challenging target, but actually we ought to be going beyond zero. We ought to be actually positive rather than negative in our impact. And I think for me, zero is a great stopping point on that way. So absolutely challenge ourselves, let's set the good targets, let's make sure we're doing integrated sustainability. But there's another part to it, as you say, there's a cultural change which is around. And that means that all of a sudden those conversations which were previously difficult become easier. Um, and I think that is a, that's something we ought to be harnessing, 
not just for an agenda that we think we should be doing, but for the new agenda that previously we thought wasn't possible. Okay, and Julia, I mean, the built environment, obviously, big emitter globally, um, something like 30 odd percent of emissions, depending on what report you read, um, is, is, is accountable to, uh, to the built environment. Um, in the UK, we've seen a couple of firms come out with carbon neutrality or carbon positive or net zero carbon commitments. Um, what does that look like for Wilmot Dixon at the moment? Are you planning on setting a kind of net zero target? Is one sort of internally ready to, ready to go or is this something that, you're, that you think is a few years off? Well, um, first thing to say is we've been carbon neutral since 2012. Uh, I think we're, we're, we were the first and, and I think we may be the only one still offsetting our unavoidable carbon emissions. Um, and we've been on a journey since 2010 to drive down our emissions intensity because um, we've always said if we don't, the only way we won't emit anything is not to build. Clearly not a sustainable business model. but. Um, we're coming to the end of our strategy period, having smashed our, our goal to reduce our, our intensity by 50%, we're at 59 um, and we're looking ahead to our new strategy and I have to say the last few months have been amazingly inspirational, you know, shout out to Greta uh, for, for challenging us all and exactly what Simon was saying, you know, we thought, or you know, we couldn't have a conversation about zero em emissions and net zero or net positive. And now, actually, we are, um, and we're currently doing some work as part, trying to look at what the best in the business are doing. So the latest to come out are Skanska, who are saying we're not just going to look at our own emissions; we're going to look at those of our supply chain, and we're doing the same. We did some work a couple of years ago with the Carbon Trust Supply Chain Standard. We think our own emissions, our scope one and scope two, are less than one percent of what I like to call the ripples that we create through being in business. So we've got a massive responsibility to work with our supply chain and drive to, to net zero. So a fantastic opportunity, great time, a lot of work, big challenge, but hey, you know, that's why I like to be in this business. It's really interesting to hear that that's the 99%, the, the, the like the scope the, in, in that scope three. It feels like sometimes that's not talked about or enough even like it and even in, in, in theatres like this you sort of think the scope three is actually what it's all about and particularly in sectors like construction then well as like um, Simon sort of alluded to these things are a journey sometimes and um, we've done scope one and scope two was the easy part it was the easy to measure it was the bit we were in control of and we've bagged that we've got that we've taped that and now actually we need to move into the, the two hard box and I fear that 99% is actually probably an underestimate. Um, it's probably more than that for us, but um, you know that's where the collaboration piece comes in, that we can't drive those supply chain emissions down just on our own. We've got to work with our supply chain partners and our, our customers of the future too, so a real team effort's going to be needed. Okay, well that's my second cue to say that I'm going to come back around and talk about collaboration in a moment. Um, Simon, um, Head of Innovation there at the Corsi Alexander, um, you're obviously then at the forefront really of seeing what innovations are are out there and how they can be applied to, to business in a sort of sustainability context. So putting you on the spot, what sort of one or two, if you need to, green innovations are out there at the moment that you're sort of most excited about, that you think have the most potential and application, potential application across business, particularly in areas like towards zero or beyond zero? Well, uh, what I find very exciting is previously we were focusing on green product and things like rolling out LED lights or electric charging points or buying EVs or whatever it was, was the solution. The exciting thing is we're moving to using those products in a sustainable way and the whole movement to sustainable process is very, very exciting. So in the vehicle space it's V2G, uh, vehicle to grid, rather than EV. Um, in things like fast moving fashion it's new business models to enable ways to, to circularise the, the clothes. Um, those are for me the really exciting next steps that we ought to be looking at. To be honest, those are next steps we've been talking about for a long time if we're in the innovation space, but it seems to be getting more mainstream. And I, I find that very exciting. But, from, but the other side of it, and this is, I know it's not a product or a process, but it's the way that people are engaged in innovation and are seeing a strong alignment between innovation and sustainability and the common goal you can get by doing the two together. That's, for me, the really exciting point. That, that the moonshot, you know, is becoming the sustainability business model. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've got a couple of thinkathons going on. We've got a hackathon going on. We're doing a lot in, in that space actually this year on the innovation theatre itself. So, um, no, it's 
fascinating to hear that's where it's at at the moment. Julia, same, same question to you in terms of what particular technology or solution um, that you think is really key at the moment when it comes to rethinking sustainability? So, like Simon, I think there are, there are two elements. Um, one is about how we construct um, within the industry, so uh, making sure that we think about um, standard designs, repurposing designs, design for manufacture and assembly and disassembly at the end of life, or better, repurposing buildings. Um, and then thinking about how we do we, we do that construction more um, more off-site, whether that's whole buildings or kit of parts, so that we can um, maximise utilisation of, of, of off-site processes. I do worry that that might be the CD of the construction sector. It'll come in, it'll come out. You know, and the really exciting bit, and we've seen this happening already, where people are printing buildings on-site or components on-site. So. That really will drive innovation and cause us to think differently how we how we behave. The other side of things is how we nudge people to use the spaces that they're in. So can we make the buildings that we build more energy efficient, make sure that they generate their own energy, store that, use it locally so we're less reliant on the grid, but also encourage people to make sure that they don't use that energy in the first place. Um, and try and make it so that they don't even have to think about not using it. So, have, you got, have, you got an example, have you got an example of that, like how you sort of nudge uh, an organisation or an individual to do, to, to well, do I such? Mean, the, the one that's on the cusp is we don't give people boilers, so they're going to have to think about how to heat their homes, and, that, and because it's going to be, effectively, you're going to have an energy budget, um, a, a, a battery capacity, we talk about, or a carbon budget perhaps in your home, and you're going to have to think, you know, use that wisely, and that will create new habits. And you won't have felt forced to do it, or you won't talk, think about uh, managing your energy. You're, you're managing to a slightly different target, but you're, you're encouraged and incentivized in a slightly different way, and I think that's the really exciting part of innovation. Interesting. Okay, so I'll finally come back around to the partnerships, collaboration side of things. I guess the reason I'm reluctant to immediately bring that one up and, and even to have asked a question about this, because sometimes, I mean, I've heard it mentioned on all of the theatres here today and you come along and in the sustainability world, everyone does, you know, they talk about it positively and it, you know, they, they obviously genuinely want to be collaborating with others, but ultimately there does seem to be some blockades there still when regards to actually collaborating, whether it's with rival firms or outside of those firms, outside of industry sectors and sort of com combinations of innovation and collaboration happening together. Um, so that's why I'm a bit reluctant and I want to, I guess, sort of help me out. What is, what, what is the dial moving with collaboration? Are you seeing things happening now that actually are breaking barriers? The barrier to collaboration often is the same barrier as any other human communication. So the reason why people don't collaborate is because they don't speak the same language maybe, or maybe they see corporate barriers to, to them making progress or something else there. So for, if, if you want to collaborate, for me it's basically the same thing as you want to get action another way. You need to give people a good incentive to do it. You have to give them a reward for doing it well or not penalise them for doing it badly. You need to give them the responsibility to do it. You actually have, have to have within organisations as part of your job description saying you must collaborate. And then you also need to have some kind of um, resource to enable you to. So you need to allocate time, money uh, and other resources to enable people to do those collaborations. Because collaboration, like any other thing, is not free. Yes, the one plus one equals three is the equation you get at the end, but you still need to input one at the beginning. So for me, that's that, it's, it's getting those three things of somehow providing some kind of responsibility, providing the resources, and then giving them whatever reward comes out of it. Then you get the collaboration to happen for the individual. Now I'm talking from an individual's perspective here, of course, from a corporate perspective, it's to some extent it's exactly the same thing. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question, and, and one that I struggle with in a way, because I think we're privileged in the sustainability world that there is so much true collaboration. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I sit around a table with my competitors, my opposite numbers with my competitors, and we're very honest, we're very open, because at the end of the day we want to learn from each other, um, and the winner will be our communities, it will be um, the buildings that we build, and it will be the planet ultimately. So. Um, you know that that sharing and that 
egging each other on and sometimes those conversations force you to look through a different lens and it's when you come to an event like ED and you're talking to people for me outside of the built environment sector and people are struggling with the same issues and challenges but maybe through a different lens and that's where uh, real opportunity and new collaborations come which is even more exciting. Yeah fascinating so uh, obviously we're sat on the Mission Possible sofa uh, relating to ED's campaign um, to encourage businesses to take new actions and to collaborate more um, around achieving a sustainable future. We have just published our Mission Possible 2019 report. That's my shameless plug. It is on the ED website. Just look at it on the download section. It's just been published today. Um, and uh, I wanted just to kind of to close us off. I've got the same question for each of you, which is, what would be your kind of one key piece of advice for a sustainability, CSR, energy, environmental professional that's come along here today? Um, they kind of they know the mission is possible and they want to go out there and achieve it. Is there kind of one thing you would say that they should go back to their teams, to their companies? and think about doing. And I am putting you on the spot there. Um, Julia, I'll, I'll, I'll go to you first. Um, I think I would say it's about go back, be inspired, be passionate, bring people with you. Don't try and be perfect. Um, break down what you need to do into smaller wins. Show people that they can succeed, that you'll help them to succeed. Celebrate that success. And what you will do is you will seed advocates for mission possible, I guess, the, the art of the possible. So, and, and those very quickly gain momentum and scale. And before you know it, you've got further than you ever thought possible in such a short time. Simon, you've got to top that one. Yeah, the, for me, the big, the big thing right now seems to me that we're talking about real scale that we've moved on from a pilot project or a prototype or just testing the water. And we now can do things at organisation or societal level. And that means think big is my answer. Don't be fearful of thinking big. As, as, as everybody in this room is aware, there is a lot of people out there who want to get the stuff done and don't necessarily have the tools. As sustainability professionals, we've got those tools. We've developed them over decades as ways of getting business to do little changes. Now we can get to scale. Well, there we go. On that very, very positive and inspirational note, um, I'll have to bring this Mission Possible Sofa Talk to a close. A huge thank you to both of our guests, Simon Graham from DeCourcy Alexander, Julia Barrett from Wilmot Dixon. Uh, thanks for tuning in, everybody. Um, do uh, tune in to another one of our Mission Possible Sofa Talks. Uh, you can just visit www.ed.net forward slash mission hyphen possible. And hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thank you.